This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. So we got pride. The second thing mentioned in the passage is anxiety. Now you can know why this spoke so much to me, right? The other foothold is anxiety when you're afraid. The opposite of a coward is courage. And courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is responding to fear in the appropriate ways when anxiety comes. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 5 that the only way to respond to fear and anxiety is not by cowarding, but by what? Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me wanna dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will break this offering You are my wonder You bring the wonder Today 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 with Jeff Fines. My name's Aaron, and welcome back to Today with Jeff Fines as we continue a message that we started last time from our series titled, The Resistance. Now, if you missed part one, you can find the episode wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for Today with Jeff Fines. Pastor Jeff is teaching from the book of 1 Peter, so if you have your Bible, you can turn there now. And he spoke about the existence of the devil and how the devil's whole focus is on destroying our future and our faith. He's going to go on to share how important it is to master pride in our lives and what happens when we humble ourselves before God. But for now, let's catch up with Pastor Jeff. Until we lose our pride, grace can never come in. And pride, part of it is admitting that we're all sinners. All of us, all of us fall short. And the thing to do is not trying to justify the things that we do, but admit through humility that we've got a problem. Now, stay with me here just for a moment. Pride is the first response to the gospel, but there's another response. And the second response And every pastor has met this guy who says, you know what, Pastor Jeff, I love the good news of the gospel. It sounds great, man, that Jesus died on the cross, past, present, future. But Pastor Jeff, you've got no idea how bad I've been. Now, I used to think that was a statement of humility. It's not. It's just another view of pride. You know what that person is saying, basically? That God's plan isn't strong enough. That the blood of Jesus is not powerful enough. Because there are so many who want to take control And in their mind, there's no way God could forgive them unless they do something to earn it. So salvation is something that God and I do together. There's got to be work. There's got to be penance. There's got to be restitution. There's got to be some kind of effort. Both of those responses resist the grace of God through pride. One says, I don't need forgiveness. The other says, God's grace is not big enough to forgive me. Both are prideful. Think about it. If you're that kind of person that says, man, I've been so bad, God can't forgive me. His declaration is not ruling your life. Your declaration is ruling your life. And the question is, who is God? You or God? Because God says you're forgiven past, present, future because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So when you say to everybody, woe is me, I'm so bad, God can't forgive me, you might look humble on the outside, but you're not. You're just as prideful as the first person. Now, think about what happens when you dismiss pride and become humble. Think about the byproducts in your life. See, in all those cases, if you just open the door to the devil, man, he'll start attacking. It's the battlefield of the mind. What you think about yourself, what you think about others, all is impacted. What you think about the gospel. And pride is the major reason the world refuses to receive a gospel of grace. And once the devil gets his foot in the door, man, the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians that he has blinded the mind, blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. Pride. But now think about what happens When humility comes in. Will you think just a moment? Number one, peace. Can you remember where you were the day that it finally dawned on you that God accepts you not because of how good or bad you are, but because of what Jesus has done for you? I mean, you really got it. 
that you really began to understand it. I do. I was in seminary class, and I listened to a professor talk about the justification by faith. And I started weeping because I grew up in a legalistic church. I mean, you went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and if you miss, you're going straight to hell. And 52 sermons a week on sin, 52 sermons a year on sin. And then all of a sudden, I'm sitting there listening to what Paul teaches in the book of Romans, that we are justified before God by, by faith, by faith, in that what Jesus did is good enough. Folks, when you understand that, it changes everything. Peace, peace. You stop trying to earn God's favor, and you rest in what has been provided. Matter of fact, the book of Romans gives you two ways to relate to God. You can relate by law or by grace. If you relate by law, it's perpetual responsibility, and you'll never get there. But if you choose to relate to God on the basis of grace, it's perpetual forgiveness, peace. But that takes humility to recognize you could never do it on your own. You need forgiveness through the cross. Now, that, there's a second thing. If you humble yourself, guess what happens? You, you, you no longer get your feelings hurt so easily. Why? Because you're humble. You are clothed, First Peter says, with humility. When somebody says something that offends you, think about this now. Have you ever met somebody that, man, you've got to walk on eggshells around them all the time? That I call those people high-maintenance people. EGRs, extra grace required. Everybody in the family is just worried they're going to say the wrong thing, right? You know those people, and some of you are in the room. But when you become graceful, when you realize in humility, because basically this is the way the evil one destroys our relationships. But when you become humble, you become a grace dispenser. You forgive people on the spot. Why? Because you knew what you were like before Christ. And you know what you're like now with Christ. And so when you look at somebody and you're thinking, you know what, this person is really bothering me and I would like to take them out behind the woodshed in the name of Jesus Christ and smack. <laughs> but then you think, wait a minute, what must I look like to God outside of the grace of Jesus Christ? And it dawns on you and suddenly you're able to forgive. And you don't get your feelings hurt. By the way, I've been thinking a lot about high maintenance people. Because I've been one. Uh, you know what the real problem is? Pride overdose. Think about it. Think about it. What does it say about the person who's always taking offense at the slightest little thing? They think the world's all about them. They think every conversation's about them. They think the whole world's out to get them. They think it's all about their little lives. And I told you before, at the moment you start to think what other people are thinking about you, chances are they're not thinking about you at all. And those type of people have such a feeling of unworthiness and insignificance that they're always waiting for somebody to say something that reminds them of their own lack of purpose. What they need is not more enablers. You know, it never solves anything. When the giant comes up shouting at you, if you read the story of David and Goliath, if you don't do something while he's on the top of the mountain, it won't be long before he's coming down marching up yours. When you have a problem, the best way to do is deal with it right? That person needs an intervention and to be told, dude, it's not all about you. And every time we talk, we're not thinking about you. There are other people in the world. And when you become a person of humility and you clothe yourself with humility, you become a grace dispenser. You forgive on the spot and you're not worried all the time about what people are thinking about you. There's a third byproduct. Families and siblings start getting along better. Do you know why? What causes the conflict in our families? What is it? She's got more than me. He's got more than I do. I can't believe he got that break. I never get a break. Their kids are well-behaved. Ours are a mess, right? They make more money. I can't believe they do. They're a lot dumber than we are. And it goes on and on and on, right? It's envy and it's jealousy. But when humility comes in, what happens? You know that you don't deserve anything and anything you have is a gift from God. And you stop comparing yourself with other people. Do you know how peaceful that is? Because you're just happy where you are. You know, he says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. That is a statement of sovereignty. He's trying to remind you, hey, God is on the throne. He decides where the resources go. He decides who gets what. He's in control. He's in charge. So whatever you have or don't have, God's got a purpose and he's working his plan. Surrender yourself under God's right hand. Have you ever read the book of James? 
It says resist, resist the devil and he must flee. But before it says resist the devil, it says what? Submit to God. Until you submit to God, there's no way you can be able to resist the devil. Submit to God. Fourth, live life. Once you have grace, you'll live life for an audience of one. How many people do you know spend their whole life and they've got to be successful at everything they do? Everything. I mean, whether it's a card game, they're sore losers on the golf course. They're just miserable people. They've got to succeed. And do you know why? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with wanting to succeed. Nothing wrong with passion for life unless your motivation is wrong. And their motivation is they have to succeed because they have such a low self-worth, low self-esteem. They, they have to have the approval of others because they're not resting in the approval of God. And so they become, they become junkies of self-approval and aggrandizement. The more they want, the more they need, and it's never enough. But when you clothe yourself in humility, you're satisfied with who you are in God that you are valuable, that he's forgiven you, and you start making relationships with people not to use them for your own selfish purposes. You actually start investing in people because you really do love them because you've humbled yourself and realized that God loves you. Have you ever met anybody that just uses you to get what they want from you? Very seldom do you meet somebody that really invests in you for the purpose because they love you. When you're clothed with humility, you tie on, you clothe yourself every day with that kind of humility that loves and respects others. You become a grace dispenser. In what area of your life is there no humility? In what area? And you say, well, I don't understand. Well, let me help you. Remember, pride is two things. One, self-sufficiency. In what area of your life are you saying, I don't need God's help? So I'm going to shut him out here. But pride is also self-loathing, where you say, in this area, I'm so bad, I don't deserve God's help. Both are prideful issues. So you say, what about in your finances? I don't need God's help here. Foothold. Or, I've been so bad with my finances, God's not going to help me. Foothold. Both give him a foothold. And destruction is coming. What about your relationships? I don't need God's help in my marriage. Foothold. Or what about this? I've been such a bad husband, God is not going to help me. Pride, foothold, because you think it's based on how good you are, whether or not God will help you. Foothold. Career. I don't need God's help in my career. Too late. You're able to do what you do because he gave you the ability in the first place. He's already involved. Or I've been so bad in my career, I don't deserve the help of God. Pride, foothold. Destruction is on the way. What about your relationships? What about your spiritual walk? Now stay with me. You know, the Bible says that God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. Look at it. This Greek word right here is a very interesting word. God opposes the proud. I, I didn't think God could oppose anybody. God is not on the side of the proud. Those who are prideful are isolated from God. Now, let me kind of build what this means. Lions, we learned, are creatures of opportunity. They look for a weak link and they pounce, okay? They're not territorial takers. They look for the... They look for weakness. Now, when we went on the lunar game drive, there was a baby impala over by a tree, and the lions came, and the impala did not move. It was in clear sight. The guide was surprised. And I asked him, I said, hey, why is the impala? Because impalas can fly. Lions have great difficulty catching an impala because they cut and move so fast. And you you know what the tour guy said to me? He said, well, there's only one of two reasons I can think of. And I was waiting for some profound explanation. He said, number one, could be pride. The impala thinks, I can outrun, it's no problem. Wow. I said, what's the other option? Stupid. (laughs) Let me show you another picture. You see this thing? This is called a wildebeest. These things can fly. I don't know if it's true. I'm just telling you, the guard told me that they can run 60 kilometers an hour. These are the ugliest creatures on the planet beside cats. (laughs) And... Ugly. 60 kilometers per hour. But the problem is, the lions love them. Do you know why? Because although they're fast, they run away so fast, but they're so short minded, they forget why they're running and they turn back and come into the lions. I'm dead serious. Can you say, run, forest, run? We're the same way. 
When we isolate ourselves in any area of life and we think we can do it without God, we're either stupid or prideful. And in both ways, the evil one moves in for the kill. As a matter of fact, just to carry on that application, we stayed at Safari Lodge and there was a watering hole. And every evening we'd sit out on the deck and have a cup of tea and they would shine the light as the animals would come to the watering hole. And it reminded me of an old African proverb that goes like this. You go to the watering hole for more than water. It's there that you meet old friends, dream new dreams and find strength. Dream new dreams is a a second version of, of the proverb. The reality is some of us are dying because you've isolated yourself and you don't go to the watering hole anymore. You think you can succeed in life by yourself. And part of the problem is you're so mad at people because they've not measured up to what you think they ought to be. Really? What if God treated you like that? Everybody's normal till you get to know them, right? (laughs) God expects you to dispense the grace for others that he dispenses to you because we need each other. And when you're isolated, he moves in for the kill. So we got pride. The second thing mentioned in the passage is anxiety. Now you can know why this spoke so much to me, right? The other foothold is anxiety when you're afraid. Let me read something to you out of Revelation 21. The Bible says this, those who are victorious will inherit all this, talking about the kingdom of heaven and will be their God. He will be there. I will be their God and they will be my people, God says. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, do you see what's, there's a problem here, isn't there? How can this be in the same categories as the others? Cowards. You say, Pastor Jeff, I can't help it. I'm just a timid person. It's my personality. It's my temperament. I know that. And I believe that there are some who are timid. But you can help by the way you respond to the fear when it comes. And the opposite of a coward is courage. And courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is responding to fear in the appropriate ways when anxiety comes. You understand? Anxiety is not the wrong. It's responding the right way. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 5 that the only way to respond to fear and anxiety is not by cowarding, but by what? Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Folks, can I tell you something? If you fear God, you won't fear anything else. How did my wife and my daughter and my son and my father-in-law jump off the Victoria Falls Bridge. How did they do it? You think about it. If they would have talked me into going to the bridge, which there's no chance they would have, but if they did, let's just theoretically, if they would have talked me in and I went over and the guy said, hey, Pastor Jeff, glad you showed up. You got a 50-50 chance here. Would you jump with 50-50 chance? Would you jump with 90-10? I wouldn't jump with 99 and one. But yet my family did. Why? Courage has to be based on truth, not hope. And the truth is, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have jumped off the Victoria Falls Bridge and lived to tell about it. On the basis of what had happened in the past, my family was able to trust for the present. And God asked you and I to do the same thing. On the basis that I have proven that I love you by giving you what is most precious to me, On the basis of what I promised you will happen in the future, I'm asking you to trust me in the here and now, in the present. Folks, do you know what anxiety really is? You know what worry really is? It's you thinking that you know better than God how your life ought to be going. God wants to get you from here to there. And let me tell you something I've learned about God. He doesn't go in a straight line. It's very crooked. He's going to get you there, but it's going to be up and downs and up and downs. And when you start to get anxious and worry, you think you know better than God how your life ought to go. And it's a stab in the integrity of God's love and concern and care for you. Think about it. What's it like to have a friend that you've done everything for, that you've proven your love for that person because you've sacrificed something that is precious to you and they still don't trust you? What's it like? God says, I've done exactly that. Oh man, I could say so much about this. When I said that anxiety, I know there's a difference between worry and the mental disability of anxiety disorder. But listen to me. 
I believe that there is a connection between the two. Because when my mom and my dad died, I did not respond by casting all my cares onto God. I was hurt. I was angry. I isolated myself from other people. I began not to trust what other people would say. I hated hearing platitudes all the time. I just needed some answers. And when I isolated myself, it gave the devil a foothold to start speaking lies into my life. I started to believe the lies that I could not trust God for life and death, that I could not trust God to keep me safe in the future, that I could not trust God to keep my family safe. And because the devil got a foothold, the battlefield of the mind began to rage, and I found myself experiencing physiological issues because of something that I had done on my own. And because of the stress and the anxiety, because I did not cast all my cares onto God, there became physiological ramifications, panic attacks, worry and fear. And I'm a pastor, right? Do you know how I've beat this? I had to go to Africa because that's where it all started with me. And I had to go back to the very place of my first anxiety attack. And I stood there in that place. And I thanked God for what he had taught me. Because now when the emotions and the evil one speaks lies into my life, I have learned to take my emotions by the scruff of the neck and lead them to what I know to be true. Which is that God loves me, that he cares for me, and that God determines who lives or dies. And that death is not to be feared. And once you come to that conclusion, guess what happens? Peace peace. Can I, can I read the passage to you now so it'll all make sense? Because you won't remember most of the stories, but you'll remember the word. All that we've said now, let's, I'm going to read it. All of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. He's saying what? You need each other. Don't isolate yourself. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Put yourself under the sovereignty of God that he may lift you up in due time. He's doing a work in you, man. He's doing a work in you. Go with it and don't give up. Cast all your anxiety on him. When you're worried about it, know that God cares for you, but be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And remember, it's the battlefield of your mind. If he can isolate you, get you alone, your thoughts will go away from God. And that's his number one plan, to destroy your faith and faithfulness to God. But you can resist him. He says, resist him. Standing firm in what? The faith, the body of faith, that which is believed, the doctrine of the scripture. Believe in God that he cares for you. Because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You're not in this alone. We're all in this together. And the God of all grace, not only grace to forgive you of your sin, but grace to sustain you during difficult times, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. You're going to heaven anyway. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, right? God bless you. Have a great weekend. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Finds. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Finds wherever you listen to podcasts. You make me wonder. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.